Welcome to Campfire Football. I'm Sebastian North. This is episode 88. Sam Chapel of the Denver Soccer Society. So, standing in the shadows of downtown Denver, situated in a parking lot right next to Ball Arena, where the Colorado Avalanche and the Denver Nuggets play, are two five-a-side turf football pitches. Meant to be there for people to just come and play. These are the work of Sam Chapel of Denver Soccer Society, and today we welcome him onto the show to talk about his inspiration, what he had to do to make this happen, and the real question, of course, why? Why do you decide to find a space, put two five side pitches down, and dedicate your time and effort to use football as a binding agent? Enjoy the episode. Just tell us about yourself, where you're from, what kind of got this whole journey started for you first off thanks for having me on um it's always cool to connect with the different soccer folks here in denver i think denver it, as a whole is a underrated soccer city it's always cool to chat with people that that appreciate what what's going on and um yeah really really invest in in that community a bit about myself i grew up in southern california played for the top clubs there was part of like the uh inaugural three seasons of the development academy before I went to school, went to college. So I got to play with a lot of really good guys growing up, guys that like are still playing in the MLS, the USL. But I think the biggest impacts I saw or, or that soccer had on, had on my life growing up was a lot of times being, being the only white kid on my team in growing up in LA playing soccer. And just that acceptance that primarily the Hispanic community gave me um, and kind of made me feel like one of their own. And from seven, eight years old, like I, I realized the, the unifying spirit and power that, that the game had just as a, as a beneficiary, as a little kid. From, yeah, from what I can remember, it's all, soccer has always been a very unifying thing for me. But yeah, when I, when I was graduated high school, I went to play at Liberty University, um, Division One school in, in Virginia. I was a very average Division One player. Um, so the, the idea of playing, playing beyond college was, was would have been a bad idea. I would have been sleeping on a lot of couches and not paying a lot of, paying a lot of my own bills. Then, so you leave college. Did you stay in the game pretty much right away or did you just like, you know, get a job, do something else for a little while and get called back? When I was done with school, I graduated a semester early um, and I immediately moved to to Brazil and I moved to a city called Curitiba, which is in the south. It's a medium sized Brazilian city, but um, kind of the reason the reason for moving there is I started working for a nonprofit that did social engagement with soccer fans around major tournaments. So it's a group called Lions Raw. They're based in the UK. As we all know, when countries and cities host major tournaments, they'll bring in thousands of people for four to five days, but only three hours of, of that four to five day span are those fans actually attending a game. The rest of the time they're in the city, unfortunately, they're, they're just drinking and they're a lot of times just creating havoc. So the the organization I worked for was providing engagement opportunities for those traveling fans. Fans would show up one day, they'd attend their team's match on the first day, day two, three, and four. We had guys working at schools in local Brazilian cities, um, working with kids, um, and just kind of sharing that message that like the, the party aspect of football is great. Like it, it's a it's a huge thing and we love it, but it can lead to to bad outcomes, especially for people that are hosting. Um, so we were able to kind of introduce them to opportunities that football is more than just the party. It's it's about unifying with other people and, and being a good guest. You know, this was something that was talked about a lot in, in the lead up to the World Cup, obviously in the lead up to this upcoming one in Qatar, uh, that massive infrastructures get built for a very short period of time. Obviously the Olympics was a major flashpoint for Brazil in that as well. Unfortunately, it's just kind of the, the the side effect of a massive amount of money going into going into cities like that. And unfortunately, the, the, those power brokers are, are usually somewhat connected to the the local club or the local stadium. And 
that money gets directly like invested into those stadiums. And what what was really cool about about Curitiba as a as a whole is it's a city that that really takes care of its citizens. Um, there's obviously like a huge discrepancy between the rich Brazilians and and poor Brazilians, but but the city of Curitiba, I feel like, does a really good job at trying to bridge that gap. And you could see that as, as how they welcomed fans from around the world and how they invested in their stadium. They didn't try to push the poor out of the city during the during the tournament to, to kind of show face. They they did their best to welcome them in, and that that that's partially why the organization I worked with chose that city. We're trying to bring the World Cup here, and uh, which to me is like mind blowing. The idea that the World Cup would come to Denver to me is like just bizarre. Yeah, our, our relationship with the bid is cool because it's it's symbiotic with trying to just showcase the soccer culture that we have here in Denver, and with with this project being a bit unique, the, the bid has been been super helpful at that highlighting it and showcasing it, uh, mentioning it, and really kind of work with each other to, to share what, what both groups are up to, whether that's my small, very small project of getting adults playing five aside in the heart of the city as much as possible, or it's um, the, the larger PR campaign of, of getting the city to support Denver's World Cup bid and, and ultimately convincing FIFA that we'd be a, a worthwhile host city. And I think everything that I've seen, Denver's in a really good spot. Obviously, we're biased of living here, but a city with 300 days of sunshine, a place where we could, fans can jump on a train, get to downtown, stay downtown, walk to the fan fest and walk to the stadium, all without renting a car. Like, there's, there's very few cities that can offer that in, in a, such a seamless manner. And ultimately having a world-class stadium super close to the city this is something that's fascinating to me logistically how did this all was it pretty smooth what made it super easy is the product itself um and what i mean by that is it's product made by urban soccer park which is a a group out of boise idaho and w what's cool about the system is that nothing actually pays out i didn't have to dig any foundations i honestly didn't even have to use any concrete anchors even like i plan to be there for a number of years like i could theoretically pick up both fields in two weeks and redeploy them somewhere else in two weeks that's really cool urban soccer park they're um so they th they produce these kind of small mini fields basically yeah they manufacture mini, mini fields so it's, it's a turnkey process of finding finding a space of land figuring out how big you want it they come in and 90 days after that, they, you, you're playing. They've got projects on rooftops in New York City, tiny little dirt lots in the middle of nowhere, but now have like this amazing turf field, pretty much activating, activating real estate that is, that's in a really good location, but just isn't ready for anything else yet. And who did you have to go through for a space in that lot did you have to go through ball arena or the city so it's yeah it's all my, my lease is through the private owner i did have to get like city approval because it's not zoned for athletic use like it, it's just a commercial zoning so yeah i got a special use permit and yeah they're they're super easy to work with and super supportive of getting getting people into a part of the city that isn't always used and getting people outside in in a COVID era I'm like stoked that you actually are going to be able to, that you're going to be able to continue during the winter time because I think a lot of people's perception is oh Colorado snow you can't just play outside in the winter time but that's totally untrue and right and I, I think that that's another piece of optics that's going to be so powerful is you know people driving down the highway and looking off and being like wait what like that's still going on or and just another piece to uh, to sort of give it momentum over the, over the course of those winter months when a lot of people do pack stuff up. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to, to playing through the winter because unless it's obviously like super muddy for 
because of the snow, like people are going to be, they'll play. Like, so with a turf surface that I can salt and, and it won't impact play, won't destroy the turf, people in Denver kind of get cabin fever enough in the winter that, that they'll be out there. What you offer are not just leagues for adults, but also, you know, field rentals, you know, if you want to do parties, youth teams being able to rent out the space. What has been for you the most, you know, maybe on one side financially lucrative, but also the most impactful, like, thing that you provide? So, yeah, leagues have been great. I think drop-ins have been the coolest kind of cultural aspects, feeling like you're you're in an area that really in a place that, that appreciates the game. Um, drop-ins have been a cool thing that highlights that because our getting guys from, from all over the world. Like I think Denver in general gets a, a reputation to not be super diverse. Like if someone came to drop-ins, like they, they wouldn't see that. They would think totally opposite. I think it's really, really cool to see that, you know, you've taken something that was a little, a lesson you learned when you were young and that over time it's kind of filtered through to this thing where now you've just put two fields up and you get to watch that exact process take place i think that's that's got to be super rewarding absolutely yeah i feel feel super lucky of guys coming to play with us and like them them sharing their their refugee story of how they ended up here in the u.s like coming from a war-torn country and remembering playing soccer in this type of environment in their home country and never really having it for 10, 15 years. Um, so really, yeah, giving them a, a fun place to play and a place to belong um, that, that might be hard to come by here. If there's anyone out there who wants to do this, what's it, what advice and message would you give to, to someone who's thinking, I'd like to start you know, put some fields somewhere, but I don't even know where to start. I don't know what to do. It might be too much work. Yeah, find it. Find a space that, for the moment, is useless. And yeah, call call the folks at Urban Soccer Park. Um, they can yeah, in a, in a in a matter of months, transform a a dirt lot into like a packed facility. Look for a place that is basically defunct. You know, I, I love that as a. A, a way to see it because I, I you know i think a lot of people might look at some kind of patch of real estate and be like oh wouldn't it be great if it's in that perfect location instead it's like no find the place that looks useless and turn it into something valuable and you'll see an even more you'll see a bigger response to it I, that's that's an important lesson for anyone looking to do that because it's not the first thing you think yeah like the urban soccer park did a project in san jose earlier this year um, and it's in a in a rough part of San Jose but it's a old Chinese restaurant that has been empty for I think a year that has a huge parking lot so they put they put too many pitches basically at, at an L in the parking lot of the Chinese food restaurant and then the local club now it's like a clubhouse in, in what served as a restaurant. So their landlord loves them because they're they're giving them rent, obviously, and they could get it at a better price than, than like a hot spot in town. It's in, in investing in in areas typically seen as useless. What it does, it goes to show that it's it, it's not as difficult as it may seem. And like you said, it's the people are there, the interest in that is there. It's one of the reasons why I think this, uh, the 2026 World Cup, it really is exciting as a, as a prospect to see how much of that fandom really pops out of the woodworks. It, to me, it really does feel like it, it could be the turning point for seeing the passion really kind of erupt from all sides. Totally, and yeah, I mean, it goes back to our, yeah, that conversation of what makes American soccer culture. Like what style of play do we prefer? What are fans like? What are fans known for around the world? And and hopefully it's kind of a a blend of what our, our people are. Like it's a blend of all those all those mixes of, of people that have come to this country and made it their home. It, it it can happen out of very little. And I think 
sort of just seeing these little patches of grass, or, well, turf, um, but that little patch of green in the middle of a massive parking lot, it does kind of give you that out of a out of a concrete the uh, grows a rose or the weeds get through. And it's like, it, it sort of feels metaphorically nice for it's coming, it's building and, and it's just a matter of time. I was thinking about this the other day is 10, 15 years from now, like I want to, I want to look at like the front office of every, every MLS team. And I want to see guys with like a strictly soccer background. Like I want to see guys that grew up playing, played in college, did their best to play at a high level. Like no offense against the other sports, but I don't want, I don't want baseball guys or, or former NFL guys calling the shots for the MLS anymore. Do we need to have it, like front offices essentially ran by all former players and all guys that played at the youth national team level? Like, no, it's very unrealistic. We just need guys that, the guys and girls, like absolutely guys and girls that, that played at some level and that understand like the nature of the game. Yeah, and the nature of the game is the key there. People who have just gone through all the different processes, no matter what level you achieve, because I do think that's important is everyone's experience is kind of similar. Absolutely, yeah, it's all, the, the game is exactly the same. It's just, yeah, people run at a different pace and the ball, the ball's played at a different pace. Like, like you said, all of our experiences are the same. And yeah, pointing it back to what we're doing at Denver Soccer Society is like, that's what's, what's really cool about it is, there, there's people that maybe maybe played in high school or yeah, we've got guys that played pro in Europe and South America um, that, that play with us and they play together. Like the, the game is the same, that the nature of the game is the same. Anything else you want to say about Denver Soccer Society before we do? But yeah, I appreciate all the kind words and, and having me on. Like, yeah, I honestly do feel super lucky that I get to play around with, with the guys and girls that play at, at DSS, like, yeah, just super, super grateful that, that they choose to play with us and, and, and enjoying that. So you come and play 10, pay 10 bucks. We play 10 minute games, loser comes off, rotate in and out, um, play for three hours if you want, play for an hour if you want. That'd be my message to everybody. Just an open invitation to come check us out. Easiest advice ever, just come out and play.